Um, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Jürgen. Um, so as Jonathan has said, our first scientific session of the day is future developments in the CSD and beyond. And um, we have three fantastic speakers lined up, namely Robin, Alice and Matt, to take you on a journey through the CSD and what the future may bring. Um, so to the start of the session, I have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Robin Taylor. Robin graduated in chemistry and then obtained a PhD in chemical crystallography under the supervision of George Sheldrick. He has used the CSD for a whopping 40 years, first joining CCDC in 1980 before spending nine years in industry. He then returned to CCDC to lead our software development group during the years where software that most of you will be familiar with, Conquest, Mercury, Isostar and Mogul were first released. In 2018, uh, 2008, Robin um, left the CCDC to become a self-employed scientific software developer and in 2013 he became an Emeritus Research Fellow with the CCDC. He has published many papers about the CSD and today Robin will be looking at the past and to the future to give us a personal view of CSD software development. So I'm delighted to pass you on to Robin um, and over to you Robin. So, um, the most important word on, on this slide is personal. This is a, this is going to be a talk about my personal views. I don't speak CCDC at all. Uh, I'm sure they'll be very relieved for me to make that clear. And I want to start by talking about the history of CSD uh, system software. Um, the very first searching that was provided was the ability to search on simple text terms like author name and compound name and formulae. And shortly after that, uh, reduced cell searching was, was added. And that's probably the most important um, thing that, that, that could be done with the CSD at, at that time, because crystallography was a lot harder then, and crystallographers wanted to make absolutely sure that their structure hadn't been already published before embarking on it. Big step forward um, in the late 70s with the introduction of 2D subject searching, and that was that was cutting edge technology at the time. Um, then the ability to constrain uh, during the search, constrain various aspects of intramolecular geometry. It was about this time that I first joined the CCDC, and then another big step forward with the introduction of um, the ability to search for intermolecular contexts. Now, as you will deduce from that slide, that was all driven by command line. So we then had a phase of uh, uh, graphical interface uh, development, first with Quest, and then with Conquest and WebCSD. More recently, there have been um, specific search um, functionalities um, developed with, with particular application areas in mind, crystal engineering and, and uh, drug solid form um, design and pharmaceutical and agrochemical discovery. And the two I mentioned, the ability to search for motifs like this one and the ability to do pharmacopore searching, that's CSD cross mine. And that really is an awesomely um, powerful pharmacopore package. And most recently, and very importantly, the Python API. And the disadvantage of the Python API is you've got to write Python to, to get your answers. But the advantage of it is that it opens out the whole of the CSD to the user. So what a user can do really is only limited by what's in the CSD and, and by their imagination. <laughs> You're going to use the, use the metaphor of CCDC climbing mountains, and I'm going to use the same metaphor. Um, I, th I think what we can take from what I've told you so far is that CSD's third software, it's, when you develop it, it's like climbing, a, 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 climbing to the top of a hill and then realising there's an even bigger hill ahead of you because science has marched on and user requirements have, have, have changed. And I foresee that that will, that will continue for the foreseeable future. So I'm going to talk about what I think uh, might be some of the functionality at the top of the at the top of the hill um, that, that that we're currently looking at. 
two problems that I didn't mention in my review of, of the history of, of software development at CCDC were Isostar and Mogul. And you probably know what they are, but for anybody who's, who's a newcomer, Isostar is a package that will give you pictures of the distributions of one functional group around another, then they're, they're making intermolecular contacts. Um, and mobile is um, a, a vehicle for very quickly getting distributions of intramolecular geometry parameters. And the reason that these differ from other uh, SURF software uh, functionality is that they're not based on the raw CSD, they're based on derived databases. And most of what I have to say uh, today will be about, nominally, will be about Mogul and Isostar, but really what they're about is the concept of creating derived databases from the CSD. And the advantage of that is it gives users and gives client applications very quick and very easy access to, to data that, 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 that they want. So I'm going to mention Mobile and I, and I a lot. That's only because they happen to be the, the secondary database products that are available at the moment. Okay, so firstly, improvements to Mogul that I would like to see made. And the first set of the improvements have, al have already been made. They were made specifically for a, a special version of Mogul that was developed to drive the CSD conformer generator. And as far as I know, um, last time I looked, they haven't yet found their way into the standard mogul. So I'll just run through a few of these. The first is in the conformer generator version, torsion distributions for uh, a rotatable bond are uh, given in the full range minus 180 to plus 180. Whereas for this bond here, mogul will give you a distribution in the range 0 to 180, the implicit assumption being that it's symmetric about zero. Um, normally, that will be true, but of course, if you've got an achiral environment like this one, it won't be true, and they're, they're somewhat asymmetric. Um, another difference is that the conformer generator mogul only gives you one torsion distribution per rotatable bond. So in this uh, uh, bond, for example, if we use reference atoms that are non-hydrogen, there are two ways of expressing the geometry of this, either by that torsion angle or by this torsion angle. And standard mogul will give you both distributions, which gives you the problem of trying to kind of merge them to give you an overall distribution. Um, Conformer generator version just gives you one distribution, which to me is right. You've got one variable, there should be one distribution. Um, a good deal of improvements to the ring um, aspect of mogul. Symmetry is dealt with in the conformer generator version. So let's consider this ring here and the magenta uh, points indicate substituents that in mogul terms are identical. That means they're in the same size range. So given that this is a symmetric system, so um, what you need to do is to take the observed geometry, generated symmetry equivalents, and then what the conformer generator version of mogul does is it overlays them and picks representative confidence from those. What you can also do then is you can take templates which are provided for simple rings and then you confuse them by overlaying the, the, the atoms in common and doing a bit of minimization and, and get templates for fused rings and bridge rings, even if they have not appeared in the CSD, as long as the component rings have it, you can get the templates. So all of that is, is used by the conformer generator. And the last issue to do with the conformer generator version I want to mention is speed. Mogul is normally extremely quick. And the reason for that is that um, if you're searching for a distribution for a bond length or a bond angle or whatever, um, there is a search tree behind the scenes um, and it's, it's keyed on various um, descriptors of the substructural environment of the parameter that you're, you're trying to get. So you just whip down the tree and get to a pre-prepared distribution, which is why it's lightning quick. Now the problem comes if you get to this distribution 
and there aren't enough hits in it. And what standard mogul does is it will go to distributions that correspond to similar substructural environments to the one that, that you're interested in. It will pull them and it will give you a, 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 a distribution. And that is normally quick, but every now and then it takes longer. So a minute, even several minutes in, 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 in really bad cases. And for the conformer generator, that's unacceptable. One of the key things about conformer generation is it's got to be quick. So um, that works differently. And to be honest, this is what we should have done the first time in mobile. In the conformer generator, there are actually several different trees all pointing to different uh, distributions. So the first one is a deep tree that captures the environment, the chemical environment of the parameter that you're looking at to a very high degree of precision. And then as you go down the trees, you, you, you move to lower and lower precision. So the distributions at the bottom become more populous. So of course, what you do is you, you search the first tree and if there aren't enough uh, observations, you go to the next tree and so on. And that is lightning quick. So I'd like to see all of those things move to standard mogul. Now the things that, to the best of my knowledge, have not been implemented, but I would like to see implemented. Metals. In mogul, if you want, you can search and get a distribution for uh, a bond length involving metal, let's say iron oxygen. But the problem is that the different oxidation states in which the metal can exist will be mixed in. So typically you'll get, you'll get a multimodal distribution. Now, the CCD scene in uh, collaboration with uh, Matthew Reeves and Simon Parsons of Edinburgh have done some very nice work. Um, specifically, they've developed an algorithm which will predict the, um, the oxidation state of a metal from the 2D structure of the molecule that is that it's part that it's in and it does that partly by the bond valence method and partly by looking at the at, at the ligands that are bonded to the metal uh, and each prediction is accompanied by uh, a, a measure of its of, of its likelihood of being right so what this histogram which i've taken from from the paper shows is it's the number of um, predictions as a function of confidence score along the x-axis and the blue colour means the predictions were correct, and the orange means they were incorrect. And it's quite clear that once you get above a confidence score of six, it's almost always right. So CCDC is now perfectly positioned to alter mogul so that you get separate distributions for ferrous iron to oxygen or ferric iron to oxygen and so on. Another thing I'd like to see is. Um, the ability to search mogul for, for coordination geometry. And I think a nice bit of work that could be exploited is the work done by Santiago Alvarez and his colleagues uh, about a decade ago. I'm taking as an example here the, the idea of a, a nine coordinate metal. What they did was they, they, they find the idealized polyhedra that could correspond to the positions of the vertices uh, in, in, in that coordination geometry. They fit the observed geometry to each of the, to each of the um, uh, polyhedra in turn to find the best fitting one. And then they have something called a continuous shape measure, which measures the deviation of, of the observed geometry from the nearest polyhedron. So that's the sort of thing that could be put into, into mobile. And here's an example of where it would have been useful. Uh, these authors here um, were interested in trying to design a molecule that had very high magnetic anisotropy, and that's relevant to single molecule magnets. And as a test case, they were taking nickel two, which is a D8 metal. And theoretically, they knew that what they wanted was a coordination geometry that was almost a perfect trigonal bipyramid, but not quite, because they needed to break the orbital degeneracy but by as little as possible. So they searched the CSD using conquest and, and uh, geometry analysis, and I would imagine it was a bit tedious, um, and they found uh, a structure in the CSD where the coordination um, looked good, 
resynthesized it and they found the that the molecule had the highest magnetic anisotropy that had been observed at that time. With the sort of functionality that I've just suggested, that could have been going instantaneously pretty much. <coughs> There are three other things that I think could usefully be put into Mogul. The ability for nitrogen to flex between planar and pyramidal um, geometries as it moves in and out of conjugation. And the classic example is in a sulfonamide as you as you go around the, the SN bond. That's data that's very important because it can have a very big effect on the overall shape of the molecule. Uh, and capturing the correlation between the nitrogen geometry and and the coordination uh, and the the, um, the torsion angle is easy, and I think that information should be available in, in, in mobile. I think an interesting one would be intramolecular contact distances. So, for example, how close can two terminal oxygens in a one-six relationship get in the molecule? And I think that sort of data would be better and more accurate than just using class criteria based on van der Waals radii. And then the final thing is intramolecular hydrogen bonds. So I'd like to be able to take a molecule like this, drag it into the mobile interface and have it tell me whether this OH here can form an intramolecular hydrogen bond to either the sulfone oxygens, and if so, how likely it is for that to happen. And I, I think a basic version of that functionality would be easy to write. Okay, so let, let me move now to Isostar. So the first improvement I have to suggest for Isostar is that it only includes light, line of sight interactions. So the, currently the criterion for determining whether a contact will be displayed in an Isostar scatter plot is it's got to be short, if I remember correctly, it's got to be short in the sum of the van der Waals radii plus half an angstrom. But if we take this CHO interaction as an example, both the CO and the HO contact would satisfy that, that, that criterion. But you can see that the, the CO is merely a secondary interaction. And the, the fact that it's not line of sight, that if you draw a line between the oxygen centre and the carbon centre, it's intercepted by the van der Waals sphere of the hydrogen. That shows that it's a secondary contact. And all of those things can be filtered out. Symmetry dependence is very important. And it's well illustrated by this contact here. So this is the anti-parallel stacking of two carbonyl groups. And because the dipoles are anti-parallel, energetically it's very stable. And it occurs very commonly in the CSD. But if you look closely, when it occurs, you find almost always there's a sense of symmetry between the two interacting carbonyls. There's, there's an excellent paper by Lee, published several years ago now, which I really like, which goes into this. Okay, so the problem is that if your interest is in a non centrosymmetric environment, for example, a protein ligand complex, then this interaction becomes much less important. So what you want to be able to do is to filter the contacts in an isostar plot by the symmetry. And then you find other geometries which are, are, are equally or more important in, a, in a, a chiral environment. Coverage is probably the biggest single problem with isostar. Two years ago, I went to a talk uh, in um, Kent given by Neil Feeder, who at that time was at Pfizer. And Neil was talking about polymorph stability. And he was talking about a compound they, they had in-house uh, whose crystal structure, whose known crystal structure, contained, um, contained this interaction. Um, and they, they thought this was a bit suspicious because the NH, instead of hydrogen bonding explicitly to one or other of the nitrogens of the triazol ring, was kind of pointing to the center of the, the bond. And they thought that might be unstable, which is a bit of a warning flag. And they did conquest searches and decided that was in fact the case. And, and that encouraged them to, to do polymorph screening. And they did in fact find a more stable polymorph with a more conventional hydrogen bond. After the talk, I went up to Neil and I said, why didn't you just look at isostar? And he said, 
Well, because the ring isn't in Isostar. And that's my fault because I brought the list of groups for Isostar. A very similar ring is Thiodizole is, and you can see it tells the same sort of story. But that does make the point that the coverage in Isostar is nowhere near as good as the coverage in Mobile. Mobile is more or less comprehensive. Isostar is not. And I would like it to, ideally to be much more comprehensive and, and preferably I'd like every intermolecular contact that's line of sight and, and, and reasonably, not, not too long, I'd like every contact to be in that database somewhere. I think it would also be advantageous if Neil, when he was doing this, didn't actually have to look at any distribution at all. It'd be nice to just be able to click on that, inter inter click on that interaction and have isostar or a successor to isostar tell you what the probability of that geometry is. Okay, motifs. This is a lovely bit of work done by AstraZeneca. They had, uh, they had a nicely active compound, um, but fairly typically for, for drug discovery, the compound was too insoluble. And they, they looked at crystal structures containing methyl sulfone groups. And they found that the motif that they were seeing in their crystal structure, where you've got two methyl sulfone groups interacting over a center symmetry, that motif is extremely common. So they thought, well, that probably means it's very stable, which means that it's lowering the last energy, which means that it's lowering the solubility. So that was the area of the molecule they focused on. They found a functional group replacement that retained activity and the solubility was at two orders of magnitude better. Okay, so it would be very nice if we could have um, the ability to be able to take a pair of interacting uh, groups and find out immediately how commonly they interact, what the probability is that they interact, and if they interact, whether there's any preferred symmetry relationship between the interacting groups. And I don't think that would be very difficult to implement. More difficult is when you go to, to extended motifs. And of course, you know, chain motifs and ribbon motifs and so on are absolutely fundamental to crystal engineering. I'm going to give you just one example here. And um, these authors here at the bottom um, wanted to find a, or wanted to make a, 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 a compound that would be ferroelectric. And what you need for that is a crystal that's polar, which can reverse its pol polarity when it's put into an electric field. So, so they searched the CSD to kind of try and try and generate some ideas, and they ended up making this compound, which worked very well. And you can see why. If you look at this chain of OHO hydrogen bonds, you can see that you can have a synchronous shift of all the protons onto the neighboring oxygen to give you this version, which has got reverse polarity. And there's all sorts of reasons, as the crystal engineers will, will know, why motifs are all important. That, well, they're called synthons in crystal engineering. And the idea is that, you know, you want to try and predict how, how you can design something for, for, your, own, um, for your own end aim. Um, and synthons are a way of doing this. So could we have a library of, of motifs? I think we probably could. You know, my idea would be um, that a user could take, uh, let's say, two functional groups and, and get uh, from a derived database the motifs that have been observed that involve those two groups and the frequency, the probability of their occurrence. That's definitely more difficult than anything I've mentioned so far. And now I'm going to move on to something even more difficult, layers. Layers are a really hot subject at the moment. And I'm going to give you three examples. Um, Zolotarev and his colleagues wanted to find substrates for molecular beam epitaxy. And what you need for that is a crystal that shows a very clean cleavage plane on which you can deposit thin film. So they used Topos Pro, which is a Russian program, um, to search the CSD for structures with two-dimensional H1 networks, 2D but not 3D. Um, and then 
for the hits they got from that, they used Pixel to um, to look for structures with highly anisotropic cohesion energy. In other words, so, so the, the, the interactions within the layer are much stronger than the interactions perpendicular to the layer, to the layer which then implies that you can have a clean cleavage plane between them. And they found some very nice alternative substrates that way. Um, this is my second example. This is by Seiki et al. Um, and they wanted to develop a novel thin film. So basically like graphene, only not graphene. And there's all sorts of potential uses for those, um, mainly in optoelectronics, things like transistors, light, light emitting diodes. And then he figured um, that tryptocene might be a, a, an interest of tryptocene derivatives might be an interesting candidate because they thought that they might pack with kind of hexagonal first packing in a layer. And they searched seriously for tryptocene derivatives and, and their, their prediction was right. This is the sort of packing you get. So this is a crystal structure of this iodo tryptocene here. And we're looking down the threefold axis and you can see it is, it is almost, it, almost perfect hexagonal close packing. So based on that, they, they actually developed a novel thin film which showed very interesting properties. And then the third is, is some lovely work at CCDC. Um, and they were looking at laser, layer planarity. So, so here's, here's the example they, they showed. Um, so in this structure, there's a clean linear interface between adjacent layers. In this one, the layers slightly interpenetrate. For them, the, the point about this was that you can predict that in this structure, there's likely to be more easy slippage along this direction. And slip planes correlate with good tablettability properties. So several different angles why people are interested in layers. So I'd quite like a layer database, thank you. Um, at a very basic level, that would be easy, you know, just to have a subset of, of structures that have a, a 2D hydrogen bonding network um, would be very straightforward. Um, hydrophobic 2D layers, a little bit more complicated. Um, classifying where the layers have clean linear interfaces, well, that's a bit more. And, and then if you want to provide the results of um, uh, energy calculations to tell you whether there's high anisotropic uh, cohesion energy, well, then that's a mega calculation because there's so many structures um, that you'd have to do it on. But compute power is, is cheap compared to human power. So, you know, you could, you could go to different levels um, but I think there's several potential uses for the result. Okay, now I've talked about mobile and I've talked about ISOSTAR, but as I've, uh, I've said already, it's not about mobile and ISOSTAR. What it's about is deriving from the CSD, customized databases of derived data and indexing them some way so that access is extremely quick and extremely easy. Um, and obviously you could pass the results to, to a CCDC interface. But I think more important is, is the ability, almost certainly using the Python API as, a, a, as an intermediate, to pass those results to third party software and, and, and to AI machines. And, and you might need a workflow tool in, in the way as well, like nine. And the value that I see with that is that it, because it makes it easy, because it makes it quick, you will pull in users that currently don't want to know about the CSD. You make the learning curve so easy. So that's really the, the message that I want to drive home in this talk. I think there's huge value in this. Okay, I've got just one last theme that I want to talk on, and it's, it's rather different. I want to show you some structures from the CSD. This is an awesome cage. That's a very beautiful tunnel shaped molecule. That's kind of hard for you to see what it is, but if I strip away peripheral atoms and draw some dummy bonds between the, 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 the power atoms of, of rings, that's what it looks like. And you can see it's three mutually intersecting rings. It's, it's a boromine complex. This, by the way, shows you just how useful cartoon representations in mercury would be. That's another thing that that I'd like to ask for. 
and that's my last example. And, and my question is, how do you find those structures by substructure searching? And the answer is, well, you don't. You know, trying to trying to draw that in the conquest sketcher would be impossible. Now the editors do a great job when they assign compound names. They're very diligent in putting kind of clues in the compound name, like the taxane or cryptand or platinane. Um, and that's great. And the best and the best that you can do really at the moment when you when you try and find these things, you could formalize that. You could have predefined subsets of the taxanes, different taxanes and so on. You could have bigger templates, more exotic templates in, in conquest. Frankly, I, I think in the long term, there's no choice. There's going to have to be a 3D substructure sketcher. The reason all this is so important is because these very exotic molecules aren't being made just for fun. That's probably, they probably were to begin with, but they're not now. They've been made because they've got interesting properties, interesting material. Materials might come out of them. This is nanotechnology. This is molecular machines. And it's become, going to become more and more important. So, so the, the problem that's going to face CCDC is that they're going to have an increasing number of structures in the database that can't easily be found. So it's something that's got to be dealt with. My own feeling for a lot of these molecules is that the key is to separate topology from chemistry. So you could kind of visualize a system where the user was able to, to choose between some simple topologies, uh, you know, a tunnel, a Merbius strip, a catenane, a couple of simple rings, different types of ataxanes, a bioamine complex. So specify the topology that way. And they specify the chemistry that they want for, for the components. And there's one, there's one thing which, which should make it easier. Most of these big molecules are essentially made from a unit, which is just kind of joined to it. So they're essentially oligomers. So, so very often it should be possible only to specify the chemistry of the unit and, and how the units can be joined to each other. The problem with all of this is that it's highly complex. If you read this paper here, which is on molecular knots, and then you just read the internet about knot theory, you find that, that for example, establishing whether two complex knots are the same is a, a really mega problem. Um, so you might have to have compromises. You might have to say, well, okay, you can define the number of knot crossings, so one, two, three there, which isn't as good a, as a substructure search, but it gets you part of the way, or the number of units in a cage. So it's a difficult area, but I think one that has to be addressed. And if I was at CCDC, I think the first thing I would do is look for uh, a mathematician who has a special interest in technology. In, in Okay, so um, that's basically what I've said. Um, Pre-calculation, derived data, indexing to give you really fast retrieval speeds and a new generation of substructure searching. I mentioned 2D substructure searching um, as, as really a big step forward. Um, and that wasn't driven because users were asking for it at the time in, in the 70s. That really wasn't the case. There weren't many users there. It was about um, opening the CSD up to a new, a new set of users. And I think derived databases will do exactly that. Okay, that's, that's all. I'm okay. done. Great. Thank you, Robin, for a really nice summary of what the future of CSD development could hold. Um, if you do have any questions for Robin, either turn on your microphone or type some questions in the chat box. I can see a couple there already. So we've got um, from Jonathan a great presentation. What changes um, do you see opportunities or challenges for software development at CCDC in the early days versus today? Um, I, there are some things I said that um, I think are very, are very important and, and relatively easy. A uh, good example would be um, making ISIS start only show line of sight interactions. That would be almost trivial to, to do. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, I would be reluctant to comment too much on, you know, what CCDC should be doing next year, for example. 
partly because you've already decided, I'm sure. <laughs> and partly because you've got access to the user feedback. You have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, user feedback is immensely important in driving priorities. The only thing I'm saying here is that it shouldn't be the only thing. Mm -hmm. Internal vision, strategic vision of the future should, should also always be a component of software development. Um, and we've got another question from Chris. Um, so with a line of sight isostar, do you think we can start to detect longer range interactions that were previously lost in the noise? Yes, definitely. <laughs> very good, very good point. Has anyone got any other questions for Robin before we move on? Uh, do feel free to turn your microphones on if you have. Suze, is it okay to ask a question? I don't know how to put my of hand up. Of course it is, Simon. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, it's uh, one of, Robin, that's a lovely talk. Uh, one of the, um, we looked at continuous symmetry measures uh, a few years ago, actually, um, uh, just uh, to, uh, you know, just looking at the deviations of coordination geometry and so forth. Uh, one of the, one of the problems that we had was finding um, was matching vertices of the ideal polyhedra to um, to, to atoms. Um, uh, you know, any, any more than about nine or ten atoms, it becomes a very big problem because 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 the matching goes as as n factorial. Um, it's, I, are there? Do you know of any ways that that can be speeded up? Um, do, do you mean matching the vertices to the polyhedra? That, that, that's right. I suppose, but, I mean, it's something that occurs whenever you want to uh, map one thing onto another. You have to map map atoms onto other atoms or something like that, and you're trying trying to max you're, you're trying to maximise the fit between the between the two, yeah. and that's, that always seems to be a big problem. I should think you could do some um, pre-screening. For example, if in the idealised polyhedron you've got a set of poor vertices at a planar then there's no point matching onto that four vertices in your in your uh, coordination sphere that are manifestly not not planar. So mm -hmm. you know I think some pre-screening heuristics might um, might might help there. But but you know this is <laughs> it's a good point because you know I I I kind of talk for for a bit and 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 you know talk about things that you can do. And as soon as you actually start doing them, the problems come out of the woodwork. So <laughs> so <laughs> this, this is what happens. But I, I feel that one is probably soluble. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, I'm conscious of time, so we're gonna move on to our second speaker, but thank you very much, Robin. If you do have any other questions for Robin, do feel free to put them in the chat box as we go through this morning.